All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of the EMI Grand Rounds. This is an initiative by the Cleveland Clinic Endocrinology Department to um, have great mm -hmm. esteemed speakers come in and these uh, sessions are um, streamed live as well as it will be available for YouTube uh, um, on our YouTube channel uh, later. We are delighted to have Dr. Eric Alexander. Dr. Alexander is the chief of the thyroid section at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's also professor of medicine and associate dean for medical education at Harvard Medical Center. You all probably know this already, but he's a leader in the field of thyroid nodule mm -hmm. and cancer care and has over 250 peer reviewed publications mm -hmm. of original research and has been published in NEJM, Lancet, JAMA and other journals. He's a member of the ADA Clinical Guidelines Committee for Thyroid Nodule and Cancer Management. Other than seeing patients every week, he also serves as Vice President for Education at Brigham and Women's, overseeing all uh, UME, GME, mm -hmm. and affiliated learning for the hospital. Dr. Alexander, we are delighted to have you. You're all set to start. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to, uh, hello from Boston. Great to see everyone virtually. And uh, a pleasure to be able to um, give this talk. Thank you so much for the invitation. I put together a new and updated talk really on what I think has um, been a passion for many of us in the field, which is how molecular um, understanding of human illness uh, impacts our own clinical field, which is thyroidology. And so um, it builds on a little bit of older data, but hopefully I can share with you some of the newer uh, cutting edge stuff that's coming our way potentially ahead as well. Um, so my disclosure, of course, is I've been very involved in this field, and there are a lot of industry sponsors that are also looking to get involved, and as a consultant, or certainly doing research with many of these through the past, past 15 years has been, um, has been something I've been active in. So I'll certainly give you my view of the landscape, though, and try and keep it as unbiased as possible. And over the next 40, 45 minutes or so, um, here's kind of the outline of how I'll talk through things. I do think it's worth reflecting back kind of over the uh, and discussing the rapid progression of molecular medicine into nodule and cancer care that we have seen over the last 10 to 15 years. And I'll try and put that together in a very short series of slides. But I'll try and also then set the stage for where are we at as we think about uh, molecular diagnostics um, in 2023, our current year and beyond, but really foresee and foreshadow, I think, where we're headed um, in the years to come, which is molecular prognostics. I'll touch a little bit on single cell sequencing, which is very active in the research world and how it may translate into the clinical world, and then also the um, evolving and emerging field of metabolomics. So to start um, talking about molecular uh, thyroidology, in my opinion, I really do think the starting point uh, begins with this simple uh, understanding of one gene, which is uh, the BRAF V600D mutation. This idea that one gene uh, was found about now 15, 20 years ago, and there was a single mutation within this gene that seemed to be so prognostic and predictive of thyroid cancer in well over maybe 50 to 60% of um, our common low-risk malignancy papillary carcinoma. And this was something then easily detected, easily identified, and I think it thrust us into this field of molecular thyroidology, uh, in part because it was also nearly perfectly predictive. We still believe to this day that when this, um, when a tissue harbors this mutation, it almost certainly is uh, malignant, uh, and then um, it moves forward from there. Interestingly enough, when you find the same mutation, for example, in melanoma, it is not perfectly predictive of, of, of malignant disease. There are benign moles and other skin disorders that harbor the same mutation, which gives rise to the broader understanding that there's more going on than just single gene mutations, as we'll talk about. But while BRAF, and in particular the BRAF V600E, was very much, I think, our starting point into this idea that molecular understanding of disease could be impactful in the thyroid clinic, uh, we also quickly then realized that it was a lot more complex than that. And I think the story really evolves from understanding um, the RAS mutations. If you remember the thyroid cancer gene atlas, um, that there was this idea that we could then begin to look at well-differentiated thyroid cancer, and uh, the majority were BRAF-like uh, mutated malignancies. Another big proportion were RAS-like uh, mutated malignancies, and that constituted nearly 70 to 80% of all of our, our mutations. 
But what's unique about the RAS um, isoform and the, the gene mutations within the, um, uh, the single gene uh, base pair mutations within this gene is that they don't always um, mean that something is malignant. And this story played out really over the five to 10 years thereafter. Um, and I like to often quote this meta-analysis by Martha Zeiger's group when she was at um, Hopkins, um, where they looked at this uh, series of 59 high quality studies. And when you really look at those RAS positive, so-called RAS mutated nodules, what you'll find is that certainly there are many of them that do move to be malignant, but there's equally as number, almost half of them that prove to be benign. And if you remember back, the initial kind of panel of DNA-based mutations or translocations, we also had the RET-PTC translocation, the PAX8P par gamma mutation, and you'll notice that those two can be benign quite frequently. And this was the complexity that quickly emerged, which is that single gene mutations don't always mean something is malignant. And while we each have our stories, I'll share with you my story that really proved that. Um, I'm sure at your institution, certainly ours, again, 10 to 15 years ago, we stood up our own internal uh, ability to um, look at the molecular analysis of any malignancy. Ours at the Dana-Farber and the Brigham was called Anka Panel. This was this idea that we were allowed to submit tissues um, that would undergo whole exome sequencing at the time of about 600 cancer-associated genes. Now it's expanded to probably 1,000 or more. A big ability to understand the molecular kind of baseline. And so I thought this was a, a great um, opportunity and also um, something I could do internally with minimal charge. And so I submitted my patient. He was about a 50-year-old man. He had had a two-centimeter papillary carcinoma, and I thought it would be great as my first attempt to wander into this world that I would submit uh, his tissue uh, for analysis using the Anka Panel uh, Foundation. And so I did. Um, and as the results came back, uh, they often get reported something like this. Um, you're told if you have a tier one mutation, that means if the mutations identify, there's well-established published evidence that confirm that this really is the cause of the malignancy. It is the active driver of what's going on. But in my 50-year-old man who has a two centimeter papillary carcinoma, they did not find any of those. But they did find a tier two mutation, which is a little less certain. Perhaps there's some investigational therapies um, that relate to this mutation. Perhaps there's some limited prognostic association. It seems more likely than not, but certainly not certain that this could play a role. And this is where they told me in my 50-year-old man who had a two centimeter papillary carcinoma that they had identified a DNA base pair variant um, in the BRCA gene. And as you probably are thinking, as I was at the time, I don't quite get it. I've never heard of that uh, associated with thyroid cancer. I, I've heard of that associated with breast and ovarian cancer. And so that really led me at the time, again, a decade or so ago, to talk to my medical geneticist colleague um, and say, I don't understand. And she said, you definitely don't understand. <laughs> and I, I said, well, explain to me. And she basically said, well, don't you, don't you know that there are probably three to 4,000 different base pair changes in our genome that really make you you and make you different from me and we each harbor those uh, variants so to speak but they're not really pathogenic almost most of the time in fact they're just um, variants that really cause no other change but they're kind of part of the evolutionary process and indeed you picked up on one this is in the non-coding region of this brca gene it is not activating the enzymatic function it's not going to cause breast or ovarian cancer it certainly isn't the cause of your papillary carcinoma you can just ignore it and so i did but i did keep reading and i was told i had tier three mutations in my papillary carcinoma this is really even less certain there's some in vitro data that maybe would suggest there could be an association there's really a biochemical pathway perhaps involved etc but indeed, in my two centimeter papillary carcinoma, there were four more variants that were detected, including in genes like P53, the neurofibromatosis gene, things that we would consider to be quite dangerous. But again, when I approached my medical geneticist colleague, she said the same thing. These are irrelevant, just variants. They're not impacting the genomic function of these genes. And so you can just ignore it. They're not causing your papillary carcinoma. I was getting frustrated, but then I kept reading to the end. And indeed, there were several tier four mutations, the, the purpose and the outcome of which is still really uncertain, but there were 20 more mutations. And it really 
just anchored for me early on this very important idea that, that this was a wrong hypothesis, that you don't just look for mutations in DNA and genes, because if you look for them, you will find them, including in a series and a panel of known oncogenes. But indeed, most of these variants are completely meaningless. They are not changing the enzymatic function, and they simply are causing undue anxiety uh, in, in the patient as well as in us. With that as a background to kind of the entry point into molecular, I think, thyroidology, I do like to always um, kind of lead also with this figure, this very simplistic figure of cellular biology, this idea that all of us learned early on in biochemistry and medical school that DNA is transcribed in most cells in the body to RNA and is translated then into the functional protein that does the job of that organ, that tissue. And indeed, there are uh, inhibitory microRNAs to this last step. I like this simplistic figure because early on, about, a, again, 12, 15 years ago, we saw entries into the thyroid clinical world asking the question, could we exploit each of these domains to help us clinically answer questions as relates to thyroid nodule or cancer care? And indeed, um, again, the simplicity here is to be noted because also over the course of the last decade, we've seen, again, a rapid expansion of other areas of important molecular uh, cellular biology playing a role. Take, for example, the mitochondrial DNA story, now very important to understanding herthocell adenomas and carcinomas. More recently, this idea that there are many other kind of non-coding uh, RNA or other genomic kind of uh, pieces of data that are floating around impacting cellular function, not unlike microRNA. And yet, also, there's post-translational modification of these enzymes. Methylation is a common issue. So there's a lot that goes on that is far beyond the simple, the simple basis of just DNA changing to RNA, changing to protein. And we're seeing actually the world um, look more and more in these different domains and understand their power as it relates to just medicine in general, but certainly thyroid uh, illness as well. But of all of those that I just shown, it to me is no doubt that proving to be the most impactful uh, in terms of at least the day-to-day -day entry into clinical care is RNA-based analysis. This idea initially a decade ago that you could do this on a single gene chip like Affymetrix, but now we do um, analysis through RNA sequencing. But you can begin to look at thousands of genes. Of the 22,000 or so expressed uh, RNA units, you can begin to understand that pathways are impact impacted. Uh, and pathways give you insight into inflammation, growth, repair. And what's nice about RNA-based analysis is you can continually iterate. You can look at a pattern and think that is accurate. You can then test it on a blinded new set. You can go back and adjust your your um, series of RNA units and keep iterating in that regard. It is no surprise to me um, as well that uh, currently RNA expression remains crucial to actually all three available diagnostic tests for thyroid nodule care that are available in the United States uh, presently. And the diagnostic tests have really focused on what we all know, which is that when you take any large scale analysis of nodule initial evaluation, moving into ultrasound guided FNA, this is the typical distribution of what you find. The reason we still stick with uh, FNA as a core principle of diagnostic assessment is the top line. That's about two thirds of the cases will come back with clearly benign cytology. That allows us to feel confident that that is a true benign to stop the process of moving the patient forward. Uh, but we deal, of course, with the simplicity of aspiration also leading to a problem, and the problem is the indeterminate cytology we've long dealt with. That is where molecular diagnostics have shown their value. And indeed, it is a good news story to put together a lot of work that has been put forth in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, I like to look really at the most important endpoint, which is understanding what, what I think we, we best refer to as surgical yield. This is what we want to see improving through the use of any um, technique or process, or in this case, molecular diagnostic test. We want to understand who is sent to surgery as a function of who really needs surgery. Uh, we want to see surgical yield becoming 100%, that we send everyone to surgery because they need surgery. Uh, and you can find seminal pieces of data that look at large-scale institutional experiences through the many decades 
that do show that we are improving in this regard from roughly the upper 30s to the mid 40s to more recently near 60%. And we have a long way to go, but we're clearly seeing the impact. In fact, I would argue to you right now, just to put it um, kind of forth, because there are a series of high scale, um, high quality systematic reviews now and meta analyses that are out there that in the United States, we really do have two molecular diagnostic tests that I think both have high quality validations. One we'll just refer to here is the RNA gene sequencing classifier that goes by the uh, trade name Affirma and the DNA-based mutational uh, panel version three, that's the ThyroSeq panel. Those really are the leading um, and validated options. There is a third uh, product, which is the microRNA combined with DNA analysis. Uh, that's the Thygenics Thyromere, but the validation on that is much worse. Um, and indeed, when you look at real world use of that test, it simply is not matching the validation data that, that you would hope to see. So I don't think that one certainly carries my support for being um, worthy yet uh, of widespread use. When you look at the two systematic reviews, the meta-analyses, the first here by Lee, the second by Nasser, what you find is, um, again, that you have two really good tests, um, that there's no statistical difference in performance between that GSC product and that version three of the DNA-based uh, product. But you do see a pattern, you see several patterns that have played out what most of us in the field have thought, which is that initially it was the Affirma product that was really felt to be more of a rule out type test. Um, because of that idea that people were feeling that mutations in the DNA-based test were more akin to malignancy, people were thinking that ThyroSeq was more of a rule-in test. Um, and you begin to see still that even though they don't meet statistical significance, you still see that, I think, push a little bit, that there's a slightly higher negative predictive value in the Affirma product, a slightly higher positive predictive value in the ThyroSeq current product. If you look closely, you'll also see slightly wider confidence intervals uh, in the DNA-based product. Um, that really speaks, I think, to this idea that we're finding many RAS mutated uh, nodules that, again, are not necessarily malignant. So you do see some wider confidence ranges in some of the published data. What I often get asked along uh, this process and as I give this talk is, well, have we reached, though, our maximal negative predictive value? That really was the thrust of these diagnostic tests, which was this idea that if we're going to design something, let's actually put the receiver operating curve um, a point uh, to maximize what we want, which is that we can confidently say something's benign and prevent that unnecessary surgery. Um, and you'll see when you look at the data that most of the um, uh, best available data out there are suggesting that there is kind of a 96%, 97% negative predictive value to almost all of these molecular based tests. So is that the best we can do or should we be seeking 99 or 100%? Well, I will argue to you, yes, I think we've achieved our kind of maximal uh, upper limit of, of NPV. And why is that? That is because, remember, we're, we will base the performance of any molecular-based test uh, really on the uh, histology. That is the gold standard of whether something is cancer, yes or no. And so you'll judge then the performance of a test to assess that based on its ability to identify that histology. And yet what we learned early on was that there was a large amount of inter-observer error, variability in histopathologic analysis, especially as it relates to these gray areas of kind of low risk um, papillary carcinoma. It really came forth first in the CBIS data that I show you below, where we had sent off, this was a sub-analysis of what was the initial Affirma a trial that was published in the New England Journal. Um, and we had, at the time, had about 49 sites in the United States. Anything, any patient that was enrolled in the study in whom then the thyroid was removed surgically, we sent um, the slides for a blinded analysis to two central experts. That was Virginia Lavolsi and Juan Rosai. And they were asked to do one thing, tell us again, when they looked at the slides, was the, uh, was the uh, tissue removed, was the nodule removed either benign or malignant? Was it cancer, yes or no? And what struck Brian Haugen and myself uh, initially early on in this study is that they didn't agree. Uh, about 9% of the time they didn't agree, which might be shocking to us as endocrinologists that you would expect cancer to be a somewhat binary thing. You either have it or you don't. But it does get very gray as you relate to follicular variants of papillary or what before this time we didn't have the designation of NIFTP, et cetera. 
And you see that play itself out in other validations. Dave Stewart's validation is of the ThyroSeq platform. They had a similar finding that 7.3% of the cases, they could not find agreement between their pathologist on initial blinded review. One of the issues with the Thygenics Thyramir product, which is the Mark Lupo um, uh, validation, is that they had a 19% uh, disagreement in that final endpoint, but they simply dropped those out of the analysis, which isn't real world use. And that's the problem with the validation, is that you really have to include that to see real world performance because that is the real world. Um, but you begin to see why there's likely a, a maximal negative predictive value that we have reached. Because if there is some sort of disagreement uh, in defining the gold standard that is as high as 5 to 10 percent, then there's no way that you're going to get ahead of that with the performance of your molecular test. You will always incorporate that error into your molecular test performance, hence why you start to hit 96, 97 uh, percent NPV. That probably is the best you can do. I often get asked too when early on, if you remember when we walk into this, uh, we walked into this space uh, of molecular uh, thyroidology, uh, we noted that the herthal cell world was different, that both herthal cell adenomas and, and carcinomas uh, appeared to be um, less uh, able to be identified with the standard first generation test. And there was a, a belief then at the time, though not understood initially, that there probably was a different genomic profile that was um, pushing this forward. Uh, and indeed, that was the case. When you go back now to data that was um, published in 2018, both by Ian Ganley at Sloan Kettering and then Raj Gopal here at the Broad, um, you, uh, when you look deeply into the genomics of herthal cell carcinoma, you find that they are very different types of genomically driven events. There is widespread loss of big chunks of chromosomes. And then, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, there are actually unique and driving mutations in the mitochondrial genome that are important um, to defining this disease. It's a critical then that, of course, this understanding would be widely incorporated into a molecular test um, to make it the most useful it could be. My own take is that both the um, RNA-based GSC and the DNA version 3 are the most able uh, to utilize these data in day-to-day -day, um, uh, translation into the clinical world, hence why I think these remain our two strongest validated tests that are out there. Now, um, with the demonstrated success I think we have seen of diagnostic molecular testing, this improvement in surgical yield, I think the, um, the real steps forward over a course of 10 or 15 years of a lot of effort by a lot of colleagues and a lot of industry partners, I do want to kind of acknowledge, however, um, that when we think about using molecular data, we should acknowledge uh, that when we think about their um, application to our world, we should still say that that doesn't really tell us, though, should we uh, do a hemithyroidectomy or a near total thyroidectomy, or should we give the patient radioactive iodine? Um, how should we think about follow up? And that is this idea uh, broadly that when we think about applying molecular knowledge to nodule and cancer care, I think we've anchored on its importance that could be applied in the diagnostic sphere. And I will argue to all of us that we are maturing quite rapidly over the course of the last decade or two. You can also use molecular knowledge, though, in the very advanced thyroid cancer world to target the driving mutation that uh, may lead to the ability now to use specific uh, TKI-based therapy. We see this frequently um, in the advanced medical oncology world with our teammates um, in that field. I think that, too, is moving uh, quite well. But the third space, I would argue, that has uh, been the one that affords the most opportunity is this idea of are we using molecular uh, knowledge and molecular analysis to give us prognostic understanding of what we should do with our patients. In fact, this was a big piece of the 2016 uh, ATA guidelines on nodule and cancer care that Brian uh, led with myself and uh, many others. Uh, it came up in the discussion, should we be recommending that molecular testing be a part of uh, standard practice? And this was really on the heels as well. Um, of the data by Ming Zhao uh, Jing that had suggested in the JCO, you know, look, if you identify BRAF E600E and papillary carcinomas, you can actually see that it predicts recurrence uh, free survival uh, compared to those who don't harbor that mutation. So it is important. Now, the guidelines had actually commented to pull back on that, that it wasn't time we could not recommend routine testing. 
And the reasoning for that was, um, while the JCO paper had suggested a statistical significance, a p-value less than 0 0.1 in this univariate analysis, that whether you harbored the BRAF mutation or not, that was predictive. It turns out when you put it into the multivariate model, um, it was not significant. And that is because you already understood that presumed risk the cancer could pose because those patients with BRAF B600E mutations often harbored extensive lymph node disease that was present on histopathology or invasion or other markers uh, that again assumed that risk. Now, that was then, uh, nearly a decade ago, uh, but there's no doubt, uh, just to kind of step forward a little bit, as many of us have uh, kind of delved into this field, and I'll showcase two papers uh, from my colleagues here at the Brigham uh, and my institution, Theodora Papa and then Thanos Bikos, two published now in the CCR, um, that when you do find the right subcohort, you can find that identifying unique oncogenic mutations is indeed very important in terms of prognostic understanding. Take this example first from Theodora in 2021. She looked at this entire cohort of consecutive BRAF mutated advanced thyroid carcinomas. Um, and when you then looked for secondary mutations, in particular in this case, in this pathway of PI3K, the AKT mTOR pathway, you found that mortality clearly was influenced, dramatically influenced, independent of all other factors. This is this idea, especially as relates to advanced malignancy, that our broader understanding and our ability to genotype many of these genes um, to understand the repetitive and duplicative um, mutations becomes important. Thanos uh, Bikas followed up by uh, doing the same type of analysis in the RAS mutated court, uh, cohort. And RAS is even, again, a, a much broader story, as I mentioned, because you find these RAS mutations in benign tumors, hyperplastic neoplasia, but you also find them in high risk disease. How are we explaining all of this? Um, and his analysis was essentially the same that when you looked just uh, for RAS mutated uh, papillary carcinomas only, and you compared it to those who had RAS mutations plus a second mutation, in this case, in any of these high-risk genes like CHIRT, AKT, PI3K, you found indeed that too predicted mortality directly related to the disease. So again, we've come a long way in terms of understanding prognosis. It's not a blanket statement that everyone should be an analyzed for DNA base pair changes, but when you know the cohort you're looking at and for the genes you're looking for, there can be value. And both of the commercial products have actually tried to enter into this space, again, kind of leaving it up to us as clinicians for how to use the data. But on the uh, Firma platform, you can order this G, uh, you can uh, order this expression atlas, which addition, in addition to the RNA-based analysis will give you um, the uh, broad analysis of DNA base pair changes and or uh, translocations. In this case, you see the NTRAC fusion that's listed in this unique patient. Thyroseek has done the same thing in their product, trying to argue that, again, not only do they um, have a rule out test, a rule in test based on their diagnostic kind of view of the world, but you can use some of these mutations pathologically. And, and I think both are understanding that we have real potential here for prognostic um, improvement and understanding. I will make an argue to, argument to you that, uh, again, RNA-based platform and RNA-based prognostics will lead the field uh, similar as they are doing in diagnostics. Um, and, and we actually see this. Um, we are not early in the thyroid community in this field. In fact, you see it being used widely in many other malignancy-based illnesses. Take, for example, uh, commonly uh, held other type uh, tests like Decipher or Prosigna Oncotype DX in breast cancer. These are all RNA-based expression tests that are actually providing prognostic information. Well, I bring this up because I, I do wanna move into some of the kind of cutting edge um, opportunities ahead. And in particular, I wanna draw attention to um, an entity referred to as GRID, uh, Genomic uh, Research, I forget what the actual acronym is there. But uh, the company that developed this did so uh, for, uh, for prostate cancer. And whether or not you're in that field or know anyone, um, a colleague who talks about this, you can see the widely used Decipher test kind of does what I mentioned um, 
we are headed towards in the prognostic world, which is you take people that are similar in terms of their clinical findings, their histopathologic findings, but what GRID in the prostate cancer world is able to do is use a validated assessment of RNA expressed units to tell you what is really your risk of uh, mortality uh, and then recurrence, uh, even within that homogeneous group of similar patients with similar histologic findings. Uh, and that really gives you the prognostic information then whether to be more aggressive or less aggressive. So I, I bring this up because the company that developed this for prostate cancer uh, has um, essentially partnered or become one with the uh, Verisite platform. And there is reason to believe uh, and has been discussed at a few meetings that the grid platform will be applied to the thyroid cancer world, at least in an investigatory world, initially uh, um, research use only. Uh, in the coming years. And that's going to, I think, provide us with a lot of initial important information where we can understand how best to use this. I'll just show you again another RNA-based technology that uh, we often hear about a lot, which is Oncotype DX. This is a typical report uh, that you will see again taking patients who have the similar histologic kind of analysis, but really using genomics, in this case RNA expression, to tell you the recurrence score. That also, if you look here, what is the um, absolute chemotherapy benefit based on wide-scale, large validation studies that have been performed? I think we're going to be moving in this direction in the thyroid cancer field uh, soon. There are other, again, uh, fun uh, and unique uh, areas of mo molecular thyroidology worth keeping an eye on as well. I, I pull this one now five years old. There hasn't really been a follow-up to it that I've seen, but again, this idea that there are long non-coding RNA biomarkers. They pulled these data simply from the TCGA publicly available data and said, look, you can find again these long non-coding RNA snippets and you can actually see they're predictive at times in a blinded validation of survival. I think we will see more and more of these um, analyses from different units, different areas of the uh, cellular biology uh, coming forth into our clinical arena. I do think our future, our not too distant future, is uh, really still going to lead, of course, with the usual um, fine needle aspiration, the cytologic, then histologic profiling. I think we'll always still use our clinical staging data, whether well, that's imaging, with clinical assessment, but I think equally important will be molecular staging data that leads to this shared decision model. <clears throat> and that's important because we will find that this kind of blanket treatment for all doesn't take place anymore, that there's going to be a lot of individualized treatment and follow-up planning. That is really the value of being prognostic, of being individualistic and adaptive over time. Now, two other areas that I think are very much cutting edge in front of us. I like to lead um, with this statement when I talk about single cell analysis. Did you know, uh, because I did not know, uh, that one cubic centimeter of cancer has about 100 million cells? And of course, each of these cells will be growing, evolving, genetically changing, undergoing mutations, apoptosis, et cetera, et cetera. And I do believe that a real cutting edge area here has been uh, the single cell ability to analyze uh, on a single cell basis, the tumor environment and each of these cells. We're seeing this begin to play off. I'm gonna just profile one study here from 2021, because at least when I initially thought about thyroid cancer, um, I would think, well, it's all about the thyrocytes, right? The follicular cells that harbored that BRAF uh, V600E mutation, and that I can get my head around. Uh, but it turns out that it's not just the tumor cell, that there's a lot of stromal cells, fibroblasts. There's an enormous amount of immune cells in this uh, cubic centimeter of so-called cancer. And even though they look very similar under the microscope, each of these different cell types in this microenvironment help to characterize a lot of different properties, how the cells uh, interact with each other, how they interact with normal tissue, uh, how they expand or they contract, how their vascular supply is managed. In fact, when you look at this data that looked at 11 papillary thyroid carcinomas published in Nature in 2021, uh, Pooh and colleagues here looked at about 160,000 cells within this small amount of tissue. And while that initial thought process I had was that most of your cancer is going to represent, be represented by thyrocytes, follicular cells, you see here in this figure that that really is the um, less than half, right, in the light green upper portion of that box. In fact, the majority of what is seen in the cancer is probably more immune-mediated cells. 
But I'm even going to draw your attention to the smallest population they outlined, which is just endothelial cells, vascular cells, right? Because as an example of why this becomes so important, they were able to look at the genomic changes occurring in these endothelial cells. And if you draw your, your eyes first to the left side of this figure uh, on the upper left portion that says normal endothelial cells, follow the different tracks from left to right, and you'll see that normally most endothelial cells um, uh, mature into lymphatics and a separately a small amount into venous and arterial structures. A very small amount go to that green box that is uh, referred to as TIP. That is really this idea of angiogenic neovascularization that, that's the tip of the artery um, or the vascular supply. But when they looked at actually the tumor endothelial cells, you see a very different makeup of how they evolve. Many of them staying quite immature, a great proportion actually turning out into this angiogenic neovascular uh, so-called TIP cell, and much less into lymphatic. So there's just a real change in how we look at the individual cells that are driving that cancer population. There's a lot going on in the environment. There's been some newer data just published this last year as it relates to anaplastic thyroid carcinoma that has looked at the same kind of um, analysis, really understanding that, an that the, the movement for anaplastic cells, and frankly, from poorly differentiated malignancy into anaplastic, uh, moves from an inflammatory type lesion to more of a mesenchymal type um, cellular population. And, and so we're, we're, I think, getting our hands around the understanding of what's going on, which is going to lead to, I think, therapeutic understanding. And, it, and impact in the clinical environment. The second quick uh, cutting edge issue I'm gonna draw on is gonna be our understanding of metabolomics. Uh, this is really the end product, right, of the cellular process, that if we are in it to have genes that are expressed that make proteins, the proteins do something. <laughs> and, and they create an endpoint that can be measured, a metabolome. Um, and in fact, when you look at this figure, it is this, uh, I want you to draw your attention to the numbers, which is that we have to about two times 10 to the fourth DNA units in the genome, but they're expanded into a larger portion of proteins, uh, about 10 to the six. And in fact, modified proteins, 10 to the seventh. Uh, but note what happens when you then look at metabolites. Uh, there is a rapid drop off on the order of probably 90%. Uh, only to three times 10 to the th a third of, uh, of metabolites itself. And that's what's defining your phenotype, the expressed analysis in the human body of what's going on from genome to, um, to endpoint. Well, can we utilize that to understand pathways better uh, and perhaps uh, harbor that? That's the idea. There have been many people moving into this. I'm just going to draw here on uh, really one study, but make note that um, my colleague Thanos Bikos also is moving quickly into this world. Uh, Ian Ganley, again, this is a Sloan Kettering um, publication in science here, looked at 48 thyroid specimens, looking again at herthal cell carcinoma, both high and low risk, comparing it to normal tissue. And just draw your um, attention here to the idea that on the right is some increased uh, uh, metabol uh, metabolites, and on the uh, blue on the left is so-called decreased metabolites. And there clearly is a delineation. You can begin to understand then some of the pathways that are being driven differently that is driving malignancy. And I think this affords us great opportunity. So hopefully I've given you a little bit here. Why are prognostics important? Well, I would argue that for 50 years, we kind of said that, you know, just take out the whole thyroid for any cancer, give everyone a little bit of radioiodine, suppress their TSH, and don't move from this because it works, right? It cures everyone. Um, but that clearly has been too blunt of an approach. We've seen a real pendulum swing in the last decade. Uh, and arguably, it's because when you look at two patients, uh, someone with a um, 1.9 centimeter um, uh, follicular variant with no lymph node disease or a younger patient with a four centimeter classical variant with extensive lymph node disease, we now would say it's very important we treat them differently. Uh, and instead of just saying we move everyone to thyroid surgery, I think we routinely ask, how much do you need a hemithyroidectomy or a near total? I think then routinely we're asking, is there any reason to give radioactive iodine or frankly, TSH suppression? Do we need to push everyone and increase that risk of atrial fibrillation and bone loss? Perhaps more importantly, I think it's routine that we say to patients, come back in six months, come back in 12 months, let's get the ultrasound, et cetera. But we probably don't need to have such a blanket approach for all patients. And that is this idea that prognostication is really, I think the field that lies in front of us. There are many opportunities 
Um, take, for example, that MEC signatures do uh, suggest and predict iodine avidity, and that probably can be used to understand whether we should consider uh, radioiodine therapy. We have no preoperative signature for a NIFT-P, yet we do move forward with taking them all out surgically. That would be important. Distant metastatic uh, signatures, low-risk signatures, these are all prognosticators that we, I think, can get our hands around ahead. Now, in my last five minutes or so, I do want to just pull back from, I think, the excitement of using more and more testing what to, I think, still help us in the thyroid field. Um, to pull back and acknowledge that we also are perhaps um, wanting to temper this by not doing too much. I, I like to show the data, data here 20 years ago now by Louise Davies um, that really showed in JAMA this problem that we created as soon as ultrasound came in and cross-sectional imaging was increasingly used, that we were finding more indolent thyroid cancer, but not making any difference in thyroid cancer mortality by identifying it and treating it. So that would suggest we're just doing too much because we were identifying what at the time was papillary carcinoma that was local and regionalized and generally was small, uh, one to two centimeters. And so um, are there ways that we should just be also thinking on the other end of the spectrum to just not even open at times Pandora's box? And I wanted to show these data we published in 2018 um, out of our own institution that simply asked this question, you know, especially as you deal with patients who are older, over 70, who typically are being picked up because they have other things going on, they're having cross-sectional imaging, someone finds a CAT scan. And so we looked at that population in our large consecutive database of about 1,100 patients, 2,500 nodules. Uh, and we really looked uh, for people who underwent the standard of care, ultrasound, ultrasound-guided FNA, and then we really looked at mortality as the important endpoint. Was thyroid cancer going to uh, impact them? What you find is that just from operative risk alone in that population, that the number needed to harm is about one in 50, that one of them in 50 will have hypopara that's persistent, will have nerve damage, will have some issue that persists. If you were to say also that um, you're including unnecessary surgery and just the morbidity of that as harm, it goes down to nearly one in 10. And that is all um, weighed against this importance that if you're in this in this population to arguably find the high risk cancers, those that were metastatic, those that could lead to thyroid cancer related death, well, you were helping one in every 66. That I think was very telling to us that a blanket approach to care, maybe in at least the older population, at times does more harm than good. And so there are strategies to de-escalate intervention. Again, there's a lot of publications that are suggesting we should use ultrasound um, to a greater degree to not even open the door for fine needle aspiration. Again, we showed as I just went through that perhaps it's just identifying high risk disease that's important. Uh, and then there's a whole other body of literature that suggests if you find small papillary carcinomas that appear to be intrathyroidal, leave them alone. Don't even treat them. There's no need for surgery, right? That came out of Japan initially, but many others have suggested you can reduce the need for intervention a lot by doing this. I do think this is my view of the world, that we still use all of our tools, but we're acknowledging increasingly uh, that demographic and radiologic assessment is kind of your initial risk determination. I think that cytologic molecular risk is your risk refinement, but all of this is optimizing individualized treatment. This is my view of the world as I, I finish up here. Um, when I think about 2023 and I think about um, the same kind of a logarithm that we've long had in front of us. Um, I do think we start with ultrasound, we check TSH, but we're asking ourselves increasingly how to limit intervention and whether we even move forward after we do those initial tests. If again, molecular interpretation, I think it's understanding the limitations of each of these that is important. There's large interrater uh, variability that exists. How do we synergize them effectively? As I just went through, I think there's intelligent use now as we've matured this field of DNA, RNA, microRNA markers, not simply looking at the one study that may show something that the real world does not. I think we increasingly look at tissue phenotype. You can see that the last part of my talk has been thinking quite a bit much more prognostically than just diagnostically. And I think increasingly we will embrace the power, the opportunity that single cell sequencing metabolomic profiling affords us. So. 
With a thank you um, for allowing me to uh, to virtually speak to you today, and I'm sure I'll see most of you at various meetings up and coming, and, and probably ran by many of you at the ATA uh, last week. Um, you know, my conclusions as I think about molecular thyroidology in 2023, and from a very clinical standpoint, you can um, sense my mindset, is that I do think molecular data is improving thyroid care, but it is sure complex, and hopefully I've shown that to you. I do think that all forms of genomic data hold great power and potential. Uh, I do think RNA-based expression, though, is proving to be the most impactful, and that's because of its ability to analyze cellular pathways, processes, to iterate and improve and look at thousands of different units. We've seen the danger of simply anchoring on a DNA-based mutation. They don't always mean malignancy, and they don't often clarify risk. Uh, we've historically used far too blunt of an approach to thyroid cancer care. Molecular data, though, is powerful as a prognostic tool. It's helping us individualize decisions. There's a big potential in the decade ahead in that regard. I do think diagnostic molecular tests have matured and proven durable and trustworthy. Uh, they are reducing unnecessary surgery. You see my take on the uh, available data and the leading tests that are out there in front of us. I think prognostic molecular tests are coming and will be part of our evaluation. There's so much more ahead. Uh, I tempted you with single cell sequencing data, a little bit with metabolomic profiling. Uh, but if there's one conclusion I'll give you, it's to be thoughtful uh, because overdiagnosis and overtreatment are also increasing. And as much as we get excited about moving forward with more and more testing and understanding, at times, uh, that isn't even needed. And so I think we're trying as clinicians to put together the big picture. So with that, I just wanna thank you very much. Thank you, Vinny, for the invitation. I'll uh, stop sharing. I'm more than happy to take questions. I know everyone has a busy day ahead as well. Thank you so much. This was great. You not just walked us through the history of molecular genomics, but also I think um, emphasized a very important point which we are all seeing in our clinics where we are all seeing patients who are older, who are getting ultrasounds with their primary care physicians, the 75 and the 80 year olds, and now they're at your clinics asking for a biopsy. Yeah. So I, I think you highlighted a great point where I think a lot of endocrinologists are saying we are not going to do a biopsy because it's probably not going to change anything in your quality or quantity of life. So thank Excellent you point. for doing that. <laughs> we might need a prequel to this presentation and bring you back to talk about thyroid <laughs> nodules in general. So there thank you, you so much. Absolutely. Um, um, anybody who has questions, you can put them in the chat or um, raise hands. There are a couple of people who are already complimenting your talk, Dr. Alexander. This was great. I, I think I learned a lot. And uh, thanks to your use of pictures, I think even people who are not familiar with genomics so much understood <laughs> what you were talking about. So thank you. <laughs> no, my pleasure. Uh, Dr. Lachine, do you have any questions? Dr. Lachine is our head of um, the Thyroid Center of Excellence. Hello, Dr. Alexander. Thank you so much for uh, a great talk. And I did pass you in the ATA, I, uh, 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 but you were talking to some people, so I couldn't stop and say hi. Um, but I knew you were going to give us EMI live, and I was looking forward to this talk. Uh, thank you very much for simplifying it. And I just wanted to get your opinion from an education uh, standpoint. Uh, you've, you've showed us the complexity of uh, thyroid genomics uh, and the role it plays in the future of treatment of thyroid uh, nodules and thyroid cancer. Um, uh, what's your insights about the kind of the next generation endocrinologists, the subspecialist? Uh, do we do we uh, feel the need in our field to train the um, endocrine oncologist? Uh, and how do we utilize our the resources of our big institutions to to uh, implement that kind of training yeah it's a great question um you know and, and i just reflect on the last decade or so i mean i think when i if i go back 20 years 25 years ago when i was entering into the field um you know i would say there was really um very few medical oncologists who were actually uh, dealing with advanced thyroid cancer care, metastatic thyroid cancer, uh, in large part because there was not really too many options in terms of treatment. So 
So what they had to offer also didn't seem to expand what um, what the reality was. But boy, that world has changed, right? There is an enormous um, uh, influx of uh, new TKIs, immunotherapies that have proven impactful and, and effective uh, for treating advanced thyroid cancer. Um, so to your question, um, it does it does raise this question. I, I do tend to think, you know, um, advanced uh, and academic medical centers that really afford I think the ethos where this can grow, it is it is quite important that we have um, partners in the medical oncology world. And in fact, it's not unreasonable to think that endocrinology as a field for those who are interested in it becomes some spe- subspecialized and if you will, TKI prescribers. Um, it comes with kind of a complexity just in terms of operationalizing that I think a division and an institution has to, to grapple with. I mean, it is so different when you think about coverage and side effects and the pages you get at night. <laughs> when you start to prescribe the advanced therapies, it's not the same as levothyroxine in any in any way. And so um, we do have one of our endocrine providers, Theodora Papa, who I referenced some of her papers. She actually is um, on staff at the Dana-Farber, sees patients with advanced oncologic thyroid malignancy and is a prescriber. Um, but she also then works within that ethos where there are advanced head and neck uh, malignancy a specialist who at times can help her when there's something very unique that comes about. Certainly Sloan Kettering has long had that model as well uh, of endocrine-based providers. Um, I've talked to a few people in Wisconsin who do the same. So I, I think we're, we will see our field move in that direction, but I think it comes with the complexity of also that we don't train all of our fellows to manage those types of scenarios. We need to almost integrate with the oncology world, right, to, for how they've modeled that out for um for just the demand that that brings. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Uh, my my other question, and uh, hopefully I'm not taking uh, the question time to myself, um, is the the impact of the overdiagnosis, especially in the elderly, uh, by the uh, the way our risk uh, stratification radiologic system such as tyrads and and so forth have been evolved to be the report that the patient reads or the report that the primary care doctor reads well in my opinion it was it was designed to guide the thyroid specialist to what to do next yeah uh so how do you reconcile that because the 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 harm is already in the non-measurable realm of not just doing unnecessary interventions but in the extra anxiety and uh, uh, on the patient part and the clinician part. Yeah, you open up a very important um, world in terms of the insight for complexity of managing kind of a a system of care. Um, You know, we are dealing with thyroid nodular disease being an age-related illness. There's no doubt about that. We are dealing with an aging population outside of the COVID world. You can clearly see an uptick routinely in just of survival outside of the last five years or so. Um, And then um, you're dealing with another set of societal forces. Um, Take, for example, the open records that we all now have for our patients to kind of see their their data. And then I would add on top of that, that you have the internet, which is the minute someone sees something, they go and search. What does it mean to have a thyroid cancer? Well, it means it could be cancerous, right? I mean, that's why we, you know, that's what it will say. And, oh my gosh, cancer, you know? So, you can see where this kind of um, hits the road, which is when you have a system of care, meaning our academic medical system, that um, simply allows, will refer to endocrine, you're not solving the problem because if anything, you're simply incre- increasing more disease referral. It becomes then this understanding of, of how do you operationalize together, even on the front end, that perhaps you need as much the voice of your primary care doctor saying, you know, I, I've talked to the endocrinologist. I also know the data that um, we can watch this equally as effectively as we can intervene upon it. Um, but I think if you plant the seed early on, anyone who they trust to say, well, the reason you need that evaluated is cancer, it becomes very hard to unpack that. And it, it, at a minimum, if you don't do the FNA, it's still a referral to often us to have that hour long conversation as to why, and that's hard, right? Um, so I, I think you're spot on with kind of the, the social construct to medicine that we live in and the complexity um, beyond just the biomedical realities and clinical research that we do. 
Yeah, thank you for your insight and, and thank you for uh, giving us this uh, wonderful lecture and it was a pleasure having you yeah, uh, giving a, a fire talk on a on a Wednesday. It was uh, it gives us a, a good momentum to finish the week. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Osama. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, could you discuss the cost and availability of molecular testing? Yeah, uh, nothing is cheap in medicine, and I certainly don't think molecular testing is is cheap. Um, you know, I don't know the exact prices. I'll say that initially the prices of most molecular tests are ranging somewhere between, I'm going to guess, $2,500 and $5,000 a test. Um, but the reality is those are also all negotiated by insurance contracts that certain institutions have and how they think about payment back once they're approved. So I don't really, I don't think any of us have insight exactly into that, but the argument to be made is um, even if they're expensive, the cost of surgery, especially in the United States, um, operative time is measured by the minute uh, and charged by the minute. And we do believe that there are um, studies out there that do show cost effectiveness to this process of molecular diagnostic analysis when it's used in the right moment for the right patient. I think you have to increasingly push into that idea that you can analyze in a single individual how you prove the cost effectiveness. But man, when you're an 80 year old patient, it doesn't make sense even in the big picture always to open up Pandora's box. So there are other layers, I think, of cost effective analysis we should we should actually be doing as as kind of broad, important research. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, anybody else has any questions before we end this session? I don't think we have any more in the chat. We do have a lot of compliments. Thank you. Um, I think people are in a hurry to go to clinic. So thank That's you great. so much, Dr. Alexander. This was wonderful. I, I don't think I've invitation. learned more about molecular genomics. Have a wonderful day. Thank That's you. great. Good to see all of you. Have a great day.